Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect Podcast, episode 27. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. It is episode 27. Rick is back. Rick is back from Japan. We missed you, Rick. Thank you for coming back. We are missing Sebastian today, but I'm sure he's going to pop in in future episodes. We're going to try to get, we have a docket lined up, so we have quite a few guests coming up in the next few weeks, and we're excited to pump out the content. Uh, the IOHK Summit just passed, and that was great. There are videos and articles written online, and you can find out exactly what happened there. We're going to keep this introduction very brief, but none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. Uh, you remember, you are your best financial advisor, and if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. And with that being said, Rick, how are you doing today? What's who? We have a special guest on today. What's going on? Hey, thanks, Philippe. Thanks for the introduction, and I'm glad to be back. Our special guest today is Marcus Herney, and there was a broadcast that you guys did from the IHK Summit last month that was uh, was really good. So we'll put the link down below for that broadcast, and we also have a couple other videos that we're going to link to those as well. And I'm glad to be back on. I missed the month of April back here in May. I uh, just want to remind our guests that this podcast is available on Google Play, Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. If you'd like to have the uh, podcast on audio, you can get it there. I've got a few bits of news to put out, and then I'll introduce our guest. And that is uh, the news is there is a meme contest going on on the Cardano forum. So if you hop over to the Cardano forum, uh, Sean Alamov is running a meme contest. The initial prize is 1,000 ADA, and he put a donation wallet. If you'd like to donate, feel free to donate to raise the prize. One of the requirements in his meme contest is to, that you share it on at least two forms of social media. So please see the rules that he has laid out in that meme contest. It looks like a lot of fun. He has a really great collection of Cardano memes going already on the Cardano forum on a separate thread. So I imagine this meme contest is going to get pretty funny. I love what Sean has done so far, and I really look forward to this contest. Uh, one thing that I wanted to touch on for today's podcast, we had some questions. Uh, we always ask questions on Reddit, and it, it's really good for the viewers because it gets viewer engagement. Some of the questions, uh, they seemed a little pointed, but they were actually good questions. Um, some people perceive them as FUD, but they're not FUD. They're actually good questions. It's just that, uh, so these were asked by Reddit user Heineken007. There were five questions, and I'm going to show you how quickly you can answer five questions, because otherwise if you got to watch through a couple hours of video to answer these questions. But uh, what Charles did, Charles Hoskinson made a very special video to answer these five questions in under 12 minutes. We're going to link that video down below. But here's the basic idea. So Heineken007, first of all, that's a very cool Reddit name. I like that. Uh, the questions are, what is keeping the deployment of Shelly back? And the answer to that is that there are unforeseen things come up during the process of research that you have to compensate for. So it causes some delays and it's typical of doing research on such an advanced project. Uh, question number two, how many engineers and personnel are actually working full time on the Cardano network development? The answer is 50. Question number three, is there a different team working on Shelly? Yes. Uh, are the delays in Cardano development because engineers have been moved off of the Cardano project to focus on Atala? No. Is Atala the primary focus now while Cardano takes a back seat? No. There's the short version. Now, you want to see the long version, we'll leave the link to Charles' video where he gives a nice thorough explanation on YouTube. And we'll get back to the remaining Reddit questions later on. So next, I would like to introduce our guest, Marcus Herney. Marcus is a front-end developer at IOHK. Uh, he went to University of Georgia, where he was a former student of comparative literature in Mandarin Chinese. And Marcus has an affinity for language and a passion for technology. He sees programming as a unique intersection of these two disciplines. So, uh, Marcus, welcome to the program. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Rick, thanks for having me on. Philippe, thank you as well. Um, so, I am a uh, front-end developer on the Daedalus wallet. And for those of, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, front end development is 
where you're working on the user interface. This is the visual component of a website or an app that the user is interacting with. This is the, the part of the app that you can see and touch. Okay, thanks for that description because I, did, I don't know exactly what a front end developer does or what part of the software uh, they do uh, that they work on. So I take it there's such thing as a back end developer and uh, other fields. How's that layered out? There's a back end, middle, front end. How's that go? So, yeah, basically, uh, nowadays it's generally divided into uh, a front end and a back end. That's the uh, most typical delineation of the of the two layers um so like a back-end developer would be working more on the the logic um deployed on the server and uh interacting with the database um and then there's also uh another component to the back end that is called devops and this is a team or a single developer that would work on deploying an application and managing, uh, for instance, different versions of the application depending on where you're deploying it. So if you have something like Mac OS and Linux and Windows, then you would have certain specifications and special configurations for those three operating systems. Um, and then for something like a, a web server, there is also, you know, different different details to how you deploy the web server depending on which service you're using. Like you could be spinning up your own web server and hosting it yourself, or using a cloud uh, infrastructure like um, Amazon or Microsoft Azure, or Google. Cool. So what's your favorite part on front-end development? Is it the creation of new code, watching it come to life? Is it looking at the new GUI components that you created? What's the best part, you think? Um, so it, it's a little bit of all of those. Um, I like the, the part where you can actually make you know, a visual relationship with the code. It's, um, it's being translated into a, a rendering object that you can see and adjust depending on how you want it to look visually. So if you're a visual learner, then, you know, that's, um, that's one benefit to being on the front end. Um, and then also the, the tooling that goes into JavaScript is constantly changing. Like it's by far the, the fastest segment of, um, web technology these days that is it's just evolving almost too fast for most people what's a day in the life of marcus like how do you communicate with all these different teams that are working on data lists whether it be the devops team or the people that are working on the back end what is the communication line is it the front ends getting after everything is built out that's when the front end team comes and deploys their solution or how is that communication process start and what's going on so we're mainly communicating on Slack. Um, and then we also communicate through GitHub. So when we're making changes to the code and reviewing each other's work, then we'll be interacting with each other um, through comments on GitHub. And then you can mark certain areas of the code that um, are part of the discussion and those two areas, Slack and GitHub, are our main channels of communication. So you're talking about GitHub, and this word gets thrown around a lot. For the non-technical users who, who don't understand what's going on in GitHub, what exactly does this mean for the project? What is GitHub? Can you explain to us the process of writing your code, putting it on GitHub, and it being deployed to the end, the end user? Sure. So GitHub is a cloud service. Um, this is just a website that you can visit and you can create an account. And what it allows you to do is save your code in a safe way. And when, when you have a large project with um, many people working on the code base, 
there comes a point where you can have many different versions of the code base at once. So if we take a, a, a code base that looks a certain way today, and then you're responsible for building a feature and I'm responsible for building a feature. We, we don't want to try and manually piece back together our, our changes and add those new features in. So what GitHub lets you do is have different branches of the code base. And when you are working on your feature and I'm working on mine, they don't um, conflict each other. They don't overwrite each other's code and you can cleanly combine them when two separate features or branches are, are ready to be merged together. So it, it helps you safely organize your, your workflow and changes to the code base and have a backup as well. Okay, so following that question, we see a lot on Twitter and we see a lot on various different forums for cryptocurrency and blockchain in general. There's this whole idea of commits on GitHub. Can you go, can you explain to us what is a commit and how rigorous are your commits? Um, I see, I've seen your GitHub, I've seen you make commits on GitHub. What is, how rigorous is that process for IOHK? It seems like Cardano's always leading in the number of commits that they have on GitHub, but can you explain to us what exactly does this mean? So a commit is when you, you've changed something in the code base and you want to add that commit to your, your version um, of the code base on GitHub. It's, it's a way to basically save the changes you've made to the code um, on GitHub and have that documented in a useful way. So for instance, if you change something in the code and then you keep working and you realize that everything you've worked on since the last time you made a commit is wrong and you just want to um, start over from the last time you saved or made a commit, then you can revert back to the commit um, that you need. So it it's like a um, almost like a place marker that lets you safely like progress or revert when necessary. Okay, so like a save point, and you can just use that to bounce off. But now, how um, I guess bouncing off that question, mm -hmm. I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the front end development. You can, you can technically, the wallet is Daedalus wallet. You could just put the letter D and then put a commit. You can put the letter A, put a commit. Like how big are the commits? Is, it, is there something about quality versus quantity for, for commits? And if so, how would you rank Cardano? Is it more quality or is it more quantity commits in GitHub? This is really, um interesting because I was thinking about this this same idea and really it's it's something I've never really um, considered until looking at the different cryptocurrency projects because often you'll hear people compare the number of commits in between these projects as like a way to say you know there's more work going into this one and less work going into this one um, and I was thinking like is it possible to actually fake commits, right? And it is possible. Like you're saying, you can change like one letter in your UI and make that a commit. But um, first of all, those are going to be available for everyone to see online. So if you wanted to go look at those commits, you could clearly see the contents of the commit and, and know what, what took place there. Um, but let's say you did try to just have a lot of tiny commits that were just full of nothing. Like you change a letter, then you change it back and that's two commits. Um, this would ultimately pollute your code base and make the benefits of using GitHub just obsolete because you wouldn't have a way to actually know where you were doing real work versus nonsense. And it's just going to like pollute um, the workflow for everyone. So 
I think that in general commits are um, they're, they're not meant to be uh, something that you do a lot of or a little of it's more based on the changes themselves so it's um, you can think of it more as where would you like to uh, put that placeholder um, and generally speaking you you don't do like one big change and then make that a commit you would want to logically separate the changes up into pieces that make sense so um for for all of the cardano um, repos i would say that all of the commits are quality there's no r real intention to have more than necessary yeah, I'm glad you clarified that because uh, a lot of times what Felipe's referring to, you'll see on Twitter, is people say, all right, uh, Ethereum has the most commits and Cardano's number two and Bitcoin's number three. And often people will make a comment and say, oh, well, you can change one letter and do a commit. Well, it's yeah. pretty obvious that's not what's happening with Cardano. The commits are legit. It's some mm -hmm. code was made. It was improved or created. And the commit is there for a good reason. So, yeah. Uh, you, people could always talk in hypotheticals, but I think the reality, the proof is right there on GitHub for everyone to see. So if it was being done in a disingenuous manner, someone would have caught that by now and they would have called it out. So obviously it's being done for good reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that one of the benefits of um, Cardano having a large engineering team, you mentioned 50 plus engineers. I believe there's like eight people working on data lists, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the idea of having so many different save points, if you do that, it pollutes it and that next person can't find that save point. If you've ever played any type of video game and you have a ton of different people playing on that same video game and you have multiple save overs and you're trying to find the last game where you were actually, you need to find that location. If you were doing it by yourself, you could find the latest point. But if there's other people playing with you, they're not going to be able to find that point. And I, I think it's pretty analogous to that situation, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. You know, when we're reviewing each other's work, uh, you're, you're making your commits in, in such a way that another person who didn't do this work can come in and logically see, like, how you built, you built it from, from step zero all the way through complete. So it's meant to be as readable and useful as possible, not just for yourself, but for your teammates. Yeah, that's good to know. And uh, I just wanted to pass on a, a really cool little piece of history on GitHub. I don't know much about GitHub, but uh, I did see a video with Linus Torvalds, and I believe it's correct that Linus Torvalds created GitHub. Linus Torvalds is also the guy who invented Linux. And uh, the interviewer said, why did you invent GitHub? And he said, uh, because I don't like talking to people. <laughs> so I guess, you know, hey, you know, whatever motivates you, but it works. It does its job well. So I have a question more related to data lists as well. And that is um, how many different languages are used to actually create that interface that the user interacts with the entire data list itself? Is there like Haskell is a chunk of it? And then there's like a Rocks DB database in there somewhere. And then the front end is JavaScript. How's it broken out? So, uh, Daedalus runs on a, an, an application created by GitHub called Electron. And Electron is, um, it, it basically allows you to use web languages and web technology to create uh, native apps. So this is an app that you can download and have on your, your desktop machine. Um, as opposed to it being an application you can visit using a URL, right? So that, you know, if you visit like facebook.com, that's a, a web app. Um, you don't download Facebook, right? It's not a, a native desktop application. Um, so what Electron allows you to do is use the same languages that you would use to create a web application to also create a native application, a native like desktop app, like Daedalus. So the reason um, we chose to use Electron is because uh, JavaScript and 
web languages are by far the the most popular languages in use right now and have a lot of support from um, the development community and there are lots of people who would know javascript uh, and could work on it so um so what those web languages are is uh you've got javascript like i said and then html and css so those are that's our our front end stack yeah okay cool and so these different uh parts i'm glad you clarified what electron was i had it confused with electrum wallet it's so it's electron is the technology so the front end stack is those like what you just described mm -hmm. then the back end the thing called cardano node where it actually communicates and handles transactions mm -hmm. that's in haskell or what is that in so right the wallet back end is uh written in haskell and then you know there's also um a rust implementation but i'm uh I'm not sure what, what the status is on um, those two separate repositories, but um, they're not using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. These would be Haskell and Rust. Okay. And so to the user, what we're looking at is the JavaScript front end. It's kind of like yeah. kind of like a web browser, right? I mean, when yeah. I'm looking at it, it's a web browser. That's exactly right. Except you're, you're not visiting any, any URLs. You're... You're only using the data list code. You can't go and fetch code for another website and load that into the the data list browser window. In a sense, it it's not a browser, but it's it's very close to the same as um, Chrome. I had a, another question. So this is a little bit maybe on another tangent, but. Um, we know that Cardano is a very mathematically rigorous project. They use formal methods. We had Philip and Jared a couple podcasts ago, and they were describing the ledger spec and all the specs for Cardano. So, you know, there are formal methods to describe what this project is doing. But as a front end developer, I feel like you're kind of a little bit immune to that because while the spec may may deal with the the Haskell client that builds Daedalus. On the front end, do you have any more creativity? Is there a spec to say how how creative you can implement the front end of Daedalus? Or is it is it free for all? Or is it more like you are following a certain structure that um, IOHK wants you to follow? Or is it you're, you, you have some sort of freedom in that sense? So there's, there's definitely a, a bit more freedom in the way you can write the code. Um, so, so like when we're developing a new feature or just the front end of the wallet itself, it's all, it all goes through the same development cycle. And so the first thing that would happen is you would determine um, a feature and what it should do. And then that is turned into a, a mock-up. And what a mock-up is, is uh, it's a, a digital representation of how the front end should look. It, it really is, it, it's almost identical to the actual front end that runs in Electron. Um, but it's, it's an image. Um, so like it could be a PDF or you can use like um, Photoshop to create a mockup or Figma is like another popular mockup tool. And once you, you have a, a designer come and make this mock-up, um, he or she will specify like, these are the colors we're using and these are their, their values and CSS and the, the paddings and margins um, should be this many pixels and the font is this font. Um, you know, th there should be a shadow here and then here's the CSS for the shadow. So you can make it as specific or non-specific as you want, but essentially you're, you're given a, a mock-up and then you turn that mock-up into JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Okay, okay. So um, using that information, that mock-up information, 
what, what, what's your inspiration to create these certain uh, mockups? Do you look at other wallets from other cryptocurrencies or do you look at, um, do, you get, do you draw inspiration from other projects to, to determine what your vision is or take us through the process of what, what you see? So I, I don't actually create the mockups myself. Okay. Um, we, we have a designer who, who determines how it should, it, it should look. And, um, you know, there's an iterative process with that as well. So there could be like, um, a, kind of a research phase where you would look at like what other wallets are out there, what looks good and kind of, um, do maybe three or four different implementations of the mock-up and kind of get some ideas flowing and then um, the best of those different options can kind of be combined and pieced together or selected and then the the final mock-ups kind of derived from um, multiple options okay you ever talk to like uh users to get their inputs and say okay here's the final end result this is what we end up making go ahead and give it a test run play around with it and then get some feedback from those people okay all right i did this and is, do you guys kind of go through that process so there that that's definitely something that is done there's like a b testing and um but you know that kind of testing is usually done by really large companies like in Silicon Valley, you'll have um, basically like different versions of an app with different designs. And you'll have a group of users who will play with version A, and then another group will play with version B. And then there's some criteria that lets the company decide which one to go with. Um, this is something we didn't do. So, you know, when you're creating these different like versions that may or may not get used it's super resource intensive so um with a mock-up you can't really play around with it like it's not a a ui that that responds to your interactions like if you click a button and type it's not going to actually receive your input it's more like a static image so in that sense there's there's really nothing to to test out it's more of an internal process to decide which uh which is best rick that was a that was a good question i wonder if in the future when more features become open to um when it becomes more decentralized and the community is more in control i wonder if we'll have some sort of a b testing process you said it is resource intensive which it is but you know as the community takes control of the project they may have more direction into what what where things are going yeah more yeah. Or quite possibly like a user feedback mechanism uh, besides GitHub, because currently people can enter um, user feedback information in GitHub, but you know the general population doesn't use that tool. You know, right. so they're not going to go on there and make an entry. You can figure it out, but yeah, and GitHub's really more of a place um, for a developer or even a user if they're familiar with it to to come and leave feedback on an issue. It's um, generally not used to say like, uh, hey, I, I like this or like this is working well or like maybe maybe you guys could do this. It's like if you find something that is wrong or just is clearly um, a mistake or something that could be improved, then you would create a GitHub issue. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of time, the only user feedback you get is on Twitter, which is like probably the last place you'd want to be getting user feedback. But sometimes that's the only place you actually get it. Yes. So um, I don't know if we want to move to the Reddit questions now and um, see what's going on there. And then maybe we can wrap back at the end with some final questions that Rick and I had. If that's okay with you, Marcus? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Rick, do you want to start off the um, Reddit questions? Yeah, I'm going to start off with the Reddit questions. Our first question is from Reddit user DFX1212. Thank you for the questions here, DFX1212. The first question is, what is it like to work at IOHK? He has other questions. How does it compare to your previous jobs? 
and walk us through the technical stack you use. So let's go to the first question. What is it like to work at IOHK? So overall, uh, I like it quite a lot. Um, so it's different than most jobs that uh, an engineer would have, uh, I'd venture to say, just based on the fact that it is a 100% remote team. Um, this is something that is, it, you have to get used to it and figure out how to make it work best for you. So I'm working from home every day and it's the sort of thing where you, you can easily get distracted or you can set it up so that it's quiet and comfortable and less distracting than an office environment. But it, it doesn't just work automatically for most people. It's something you have to put effort into to figure out how to make it fit your personality. So this is like a, a learning curve that I've had to, you know, get better at. Um, overall, though, I do like working from home because it's I actually find a, an office environment more distracting than um, people realize. Uh, it's it's not something you really can can tell the difference between until you've worked from home and then you've also worked in an office. But for instance, like at an office, you have a lot of people wanting to talk and just do a million different things that are unrelated to work. Um, but at home, you, you know, you can just be by yourself and, you know, for some that might really boost their productivity. And I, I tend to like, uh, the quietness of being at home. So, um, another challenge with working for IOHK is just the online communication. So since we're using Slack and, and GitHub to talk to each other, it requires, um, just a certain level of willingness to put in the effort to make your communication clear. Um, you know, if you're someone who doesn't like to, you know, describe the things through written format, then it may be a hassle or you may have your, your, your meaning behind something just misconstrued because you're not detailed enough or, you didn't give context. So, you know, you're always operating under the, the assumption that you need to be as clear and comprehensive, comprehensive as possible when you're explaining something to your teammates. And that definitely takes a bit of extra work. Um, so that, that, you know, that's kind of the aspect, the, uh, working from home part. And then, I also, I think it's really exciting to be working on uh, a cryptocurrency project. And since Cardano is the most interesting project to me, it's really, it, it's an exciting job. It's, um, you know, it's something that I would want to work on, even if it wasn't uh, my job. I would want to be involved in a project like this and keeping up to date with it. So it, it really has some intrinsic motivation there. Um, and then working with a lot of other really smart engineers is, uh, is great. Yeah, that must be inspiring. And, you know, thanks for that answer because you also answered the following question. How does it compare to your previous jobs where basically it's the opposite of what you described? You got previous jobs, I'm assuming there's a lot of office interruptions while you're trying to write code. When you have a massive train of thought going, you need to get that code pushed out right to your computer. And you don't want to have you know someone pop in and say, hey, we got to clean the windows or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the last, the, the third part of DFX1212, their question was, uh, walk us through the technical stack you use, which you kind of touched on earlier, but uh, what technical stack do you use? Um, so we use uh, React to write our JavaScript. And this is a, a JavaScript library that lets you break your code up into these reusable chunks. So, uh, for instance, React Polymorph, the, uh, 
this is also a repo under IOHK's GitHub. Um, it's the the component library that's used throughout Daedalus, and these React components are things like uh, the autocomplete that when you're typing in your mnemonic uh, phrase, like whether when you're like creating a wallet or restoring one, it'll take the text you've typed in and then give you suggestions and you click the word. So this is in itself a, a an autocomplete component. Um, so we're using React to separate the UI into these reusable chunks. Um, then let's see, we've got for uh, state management, we use MobX. And this is sort of like the, the part of the front end that um, serves as like short term memory while a user is engaging with the wallet. Like if you're typing in um, text to name your, your wallet, it's keeping the input you've entered and it has it in what's called a store. And this is the, the memory of the front end while you're, you're using the wallet and a single session. When you close it out, then that store is deleted and it starts over next time you open it. So that tool is MobX. And then, go ahead, Rick. Oh, no, that's good. You can you can keep going. But uh, it sounds like you're using tools that have a good pedigree behind them and they've, they're well proven. Yeah, definitely. These are all tools that people use in many different um, products and applications. Um, so let's see, then for our CSS, we use CSS modules and post CSS. This is a tool that allows you to import your, your chunks of CSS into a JavaScript file and apply them directly in the JavaScript. So it, it also kind of works like React in the sense that you can create separations of your your CSS code and these and these chunks and it helps with organization that way as well um, and then we use uh, webpack as our module bundler and this takes all of the code and compiles it into a a version of the code that the uh, electron Chromium browser can understand. So it really, it takes it all and it creates a bundle. And this is like one giant file that contains the code for the entire app. And then it loads that into Electron. Um, it's pretty complicated and tedious. Uh, a lot can go wrong with, with Webpack. So that's a fun little part. <laughs> <laughs> Is, right. is this real quick is this compiler is it specific to cardano or is it something general that lots of different projects use yeah it's a, it's an open source tool that a lot of projects use okay okay all, all of these tools that i'm naming are open source tools that are supported either by a, a company or like a group of developers Great responses, Marcus. So we have the user Smith9876543321. Great username. And uh, the first question is, how many years have you been developing? I believe I'm going on four and a half years. Four and a half years. Yeah. And Marcus, why don't you explain that you're, you're self-taught and right. give them a little background of, of, of how you started. So um, I think Rick mentioned at the beginning that I went to UGA and I studied comparative literature and Chinese. And, you know, this is sort of thought to be unrelated to programming. Um, and I, I tend to disagree because uh, programming languages are languages, right? And I find that there's a, uh, a crossover between someone's ability to learn uh, and speak like a new language um, with teaching oneself a programming language and, and using that. So 
the way I got uh, into programming is through studying Chinese, which seems a little odd and just unrelated, but uh, th that's kind of like how I got to where I am. And the way that worked is I, uh, I took a year off of school at UGA and I, I went to China and I lived with this uh, Chinese host family in a small town, like in the countryside of, of China. And the point of uh, moving there was to learn Chinese. And this uh, host family, they didn't speak any English. And at the time I was 20 years old, it was my second year of school. Um, and I, I, I knew that in order to really learn Chinese um, in a way that's, uh, you know, not something you just forget at the end of a semester or at the end of a year, I would need to actually learn it in China and use it consistently to, to kind of build up that, that foundation of the language. So while I was there, um, I was studying Chinese like about eight hours a day for, for the year. And after about six months, I, I was conversationally fluent to the point where I could speak with this host family and like interact with other students at, at the university. Um, but what I really loved about that year was the process of studying Chinese itself. And it just, it felt like something that you could study for years and years and really never uh, say, okay, I, I'm done. Like I've learned it all. Um, I've mastered it or, you know, we've reached the, the bottom of the well. It, it, it was the first thing I had ever studied that felt like that, that there was no limit to it. And I really loved that because you can, first of all, you can see the progress you make and the more effort you put into it, the, the more it gives back to you. And it's, it's kind of an exponential effect where you, you start learning twice as fast and then four times as fast and so on. Um, so after that year, I came back and did three more years of school at UGA studying comparative literature, which is a lot of writing and like critical analysis. Um, and then after I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, there aren't many like job options for a comparative literature major. You can teach uh, comparative literature, <laughs> basically. Um, you can, you know, try to write uh, content for like either a, a magazine or online website, but that didn't really seem that attractive um, to me. So what I did is I, I moved to Saigon, Vietnam and started teaching English there. And while I was there, I was kind of weighing my, my options and like trying to figure out what I actually wanted to do for a career. And I, I, I looked into programming and I started to learn um, Python. And I quickly realized that programming is itself like learning a foreign language, um, just like Chinese was. And that also it's the sort of thing where there's no end to it. You can put in a lifetime of, of learning and you still won't really know everything. It, you know, cause it's always changing. There's always new ways of doing something like new, new things to build that require, um, new features of a language and like new tools and libraries. And it, it felt very similar to how I felt when I was learning Chinese. So, I figured this is more of a career um, skill and tool. So I started learning Python and did that for about three months and then kind of saw that web technologies were, um, you could say in demand and had a lot of opportunity in them. So that's when I kind of switched over to JavaScript and got into web development. And then from there, just haven't stopped. Yeah, that's a fascinating life story. Thanks. Go ahead, and it just goes to show you how passionate people that are working on this project 
Um, I, I know Marcus outside of this podcast, and he is a very passionate developer. And it's very reassuring to see that there are other people, your teammates are also very passionate about this project and um, the future of this project. So moving forward to the next question um, from Smith, he also says, is JavaScript a real language? You can answer that if you want. A real language. Yeah. Um, I would say it. It barely qualifies. Okay, <laughs> great response. <laughs> Last question. It's a two-part question. Do you smoke weed? And can weed help me code? So uh, he's obviously an aspiring coder who who may be growing some plants wherever he's at. So what do you so, think, Marcus? <laughs> well, despite living in San Francisco, um, I do not smoke weed. Um, and then... As far as does weed help him code better, um, I think experimentation and trial and error will be the way to figure that out. I, <laughs> I can't say for sure. Okay. <laughs> That's a great, great response. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Okay. Rick, you want to get the next question? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, occasionally if we have some of these really kind of oddball questions come up on Reddit, you know, we'll go ahead and ask them. <laughs> okay. okay, guys. Mystical Writer asks, how is the front end separated from the back end? And who designs the user interface? Let's start with how's the front end separated from the back end? So they're separated in the sense that they are <clears throat> different processes running um, on Daedalus. So like Daedalus is, is different from a, a web app. And I can kind of sh like explain the differences there, but in Daedalus, you have the the edge node that is running your your wallet um, backend and the node that is communicating with the network, right? And this also is going to update your copy of the blockchain and allow you to uh, create new transactions and etc. Um, so it, it's. It, this is a, a separate process from the electron process that is running the front end. Um, they are related to one another, but you could easily say they're, they're two separate applications, but they're, they're designed in such a way that they know how to communicate with each other. Okay. And that makes sense. Um, like when I've opened up the app before, open up the system monitor or the system processes list, there's a couple apps called Daedalus and Daedalus Helper. And there's another app called Cardano Node. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming those are the front end and the back end. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so the, the other question from Mystical Writer is who designs the user interface? I'm wondering if they're asking the name of the person or the name of a company or a contractor. So the, the designer is uh, Alexander Sasha. I believe uh, I pronounced his name correctly, but um, yeah, he lives in um, Russia and we work closely with him. He's, he's uh, just recently started working full time um, with the Daedalus team to do his design work. Whereas previously, I, th I think he was helping design other um, products for IOHK, um, but now he's solely focusing on Daedalus. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks for those answers. And uh, is there anything you can secretly leak to us on the podcast? I take it now. Well, that wouldn't be much of a secret, right? No, nah, it wouldn't be. Okay. <laughs> All right, Philippe, <laughs> you want to okay. take Give Me the Coins? Yes. Yeah. Give Me the Coins. Ask um, first question What web apps are you currently working on? I work on Daedalus. And yeah. then I also work on React Polymorph, which is the component library. Okay, that's yeah. good. Um, next question, what are you looking forward to in the next year and the next five? So over the next year, I'm pretty excited to uh, just get the, the whole staking UI built out. Um, we've started working on that. And so the, this is exciting for two reasons. Um, one, it, it's a brand new feature. So we're building everything to do with, with staking and Daedalus uh, from scratch. So it, it's always fun to, to build something completely new. 
And then also it, it's such a, you, you know, new technology as well that it's fun to build something that doesn't exist. Um, whereas if you're working at another company, like you're probably building a web app that is similar to another web app that maybe does one thing better or is like just a prettier version of another one, right? There's, you know, that's not necessarily true for everyone, but I do see that a lot of products are closely related to other products and companies compete with each other in this sense. But um, with Cardano, it's, it, it's like trailblazing um, a new type of product, like de a decentralized ecosystem. And then, you, you know, Daedalus is a decentralized app as well. And then proof of stake is, you know, a new phenomenon. That's so, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Marcus, we were together in the staking presentation at the summit and they displayed some of the some of the graphics of what's what it's going to look like. And um, uh, can you can you lead us into whoever was at the summit? I mean, I'm, I think it's online as well. Um, Jared's section wasn't online, but um, can you lead us and tell us maybe like, are they consistent with the images that were displayed at, um, at, at the summit? Yeah, so what was shown at the summit is the mock-up that we're using to build the UI itself. And, um, you know, there may be changes along the way that improve some of those mock-ups that were shown, but for the most part, you know, as of right now, what you saw at the summit is what we are currently building. That's awesome. That's great to hear. And it's reassuring because this is a software product. It's not like a tangible product where you go to some kind of convention and they give you some kind of prototype and you know that it's not going to turn out like that when it actually gets deployed. But with software, it's a little bit different because you can actually visually represent what you're trying to what you're trying to portray. So there's there's a high chance, a good chance that it's going to look like whatever it's supposed to look like. And if not, it may be better. So, yeah. So it's only it only goes up from there. So that's good to hear. Um, the uh, next question is. Oh yeah, next five years. Um, yeah, next five years. Uh, that's a, that's a long time. It's a long time frame. But what do you think? I, I think I'm excited to see the ways in which uh, cryptocurrency is adopted, and see how different the landscape is five years from now, um, and and be able to look back and remember, you know, what we're working on now, and what you what all you can do with cryptocurrency and how, how the user experience is, uh, which is generally poor. Um, I mean, there, you know, it's very early stage. So I, I'm really excited to see if within five years it becomes a, on par with, um, just standard web application products. If, if you can interface with a blockchain network and make transactions and, um, use smart contracts as if it's just another web app um, and have the same responsiveness and um, user experience overall. Makes sense. Makes sense. Five years is going to be a completely different landscape. And if you can make it five years, yeah, the game will be completely different. Yeah, that's probably a great time horizon to, to be in this space. I know so, it's not once he said Lambo. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't say Lambo. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. You I, I don't think I would buy a Lambo if if I could afford one. That's probably not my first stop. Where Where are you going to park the Lambo in San Francisco? You know, that's going to be the parking spot's probably more expensive than the Lambo. It, over time, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> parking spots are about um, three hundred, four hundred dollars a month. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's. But you don't want to be keeping it outside, you know, like it has to be in some kind of super valet area in, in San Francisco. Right. You would either need a uh, $20 million two bedroom house with a garage <laughs> yeah. um, or you uh, you probably wouldn't want to keep it here because it, yeah. the windows will get broken out more than likely. 
Yeah, that's good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> okay, last question from um, uh, Give Me the Coins is, what is the most impressive application of JavaScript you have ever seen and why? Thank you. Some of the uh, trading software I've seen is is quite impressive. Um, it's like, for instance, TradingView is, um, is, is a web app where you can, you know, analyze the charts and do a ton of different things, right? But it's it's not even necessarily like the best user experience and like the most polished app I've ever used, but the, the like the actual way that JavaScript can produce such an application is, is quite impressive to me because it's it, it's so much more complicated than, for instance, like checking Instagram, um, and the way they may all they make all of that run in the browser at with almost no latency is impressive. So that's the first one that comes to mind. Okay. 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 That's good. That's good. So I think that um, thank you. Give me the coins for those questions, Rick. Do you want to get the next question? All right, so the next question is from Zendoff. The question is, what is GPU safe mode in Daedalus? Why is it needed? And why do other Electron-based apps don't have it? And unfortunately, we cannot answer that question right now. There is some information on GitHub about GPU safe mode. We can look that up and provide some more data, but we can't answer that one. We don't want to give you bad information. So uh, we'll go to the next one, Nate Lovell. And uh, Nate asks, Reddit user Nate Lovell asks, what do you think of React if you've used it? Now, you mentioned already that you have used it. What do you think of it? I definitely like React. Um, it's uh, more flexible than a lot of other JavaScript libraries out there. And I like how it, it really allows you to do as little or as, um, as a lot as you want. Um, you can... You can make it in such a way that other developers can really combine their own needs into um, the components, so that it can it can be like strict, so that a component only does a certain set of functionalities, or you can kind of leave it open ended and like uh, like with React Polymorph, that was really the way we made that library is you can add your own styles or your own HTML and essentially rendering, or you can use everything out of the box that we provide, um, or just use the logic and um, add your own uh, theme, but then use our HTML. It's, it's really a way to, to, Keep it lightweight, but powerful. Yeah, the powerful flexibility is kind of what I get from that. Um, yeah. And plus, you can either manually create your own stuff or you can use pre-built stuff. Sounds like a pretty good app. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, so that was it from Nate Lovell. Thank you, Nate, for that question. Last one, Philippe. Tag, you're it. This question is <laughs> one of those. <laughs> okay. All right, Marcus. You can take this question how you want. Um once again, we have Marcus Herney, a front-end developer for Daedalus, answering this question. We do not have Charles Hoskinson. So if you do not feel comfortable answering this question, I completely understand. And the username is Adenoma. And he's, he's, um, this person said, can you, give the community, can you give the community categorical assurance that Shelly will be completely rolled out the mainnet before 2020? categorical assurance. And I believe that Charles the other day said, if if it if it's not before 2020, he'd eat his shoe. So, <laughs> um, you know, what kind of assurance can you give the people? Yeah, you know, it's not really possible for me to speak about dates and, and timelines because A, I'm not working on like the actual Cardano blockchain right so that that's a separate team from from Daedalus um, and then also I'm also I'm not setting 
the release dates and, and timelines and announcing those publicly. So, it, you know, that I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question to. Um, but I would uh, say that I would personally be surprised if um, we didn't see a lot more released by 2020. Okay, we'll leave it at that. I, I would be surprised personally. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need anyone coming after Marcus if, <laughs> if something goes wrong, you know. It's uh yeah. And for but, can I answer that question? Yeah, go for it, Rick. I have an answer for that question. It's actually a pretty accurate answer for any of this software. And the answer is is some form of Shelly gonna be out by 2020? Yeah, some form of Shelly will be out by 2020 where it will be functional. But Cardano will never be done. It will be under development forever. That's why there's a treasury. So the Shelly we have today will probably be the baseline Shelly for years and years to come. But the underlying technology, it might change a little because that's just how software is. I mean, the Microsoft PowerPoint that I use today is not what I used 10 years ago. It's, very, it's a little bit different. It, does the same thing the capability is the same but how you get there has changed so that's my take on those kind of questions yes the technology will be out however you're still going to see it morph over the years cardano is never going to be done yes i agree and guys and girls who are cardano advocates and cardano enthusiasts we have one chance to get this right when we deploy it um if it's deployed and it has bugs or it's very incomplete, there's always going to be iterations that we're going to add on to Shelly. But if we release an incomplete product, we're not going to be able to roll back the time because once the staking pools are, are participating and epochs are being completed, you, you're not going to be able to roll that back to previous epochs and change the rules for those previous epochs. It's going to mess up the entire system. So we want to make sure it's done correctly the first time. I know the patience level is 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 teetering and everyone wants to get involved but once once it gets released it's not like IOHK is going to pull it back and say you know we're going we're going backwards we hit the main net I'm going to bring it back to testnet and bring it back to the federated nodes that they're running right now once it's ours it's ours and um, we just have to we just have to be patient and it's hard in cryptocurrency because one day feels like one week a one month feels like two years. So you know you have to remember that a lot of you think that you've been in the game for like 20 years, but in reality, it's only been a couple of months and nothing really major has changed. I don't know, Marcus, did you want to add anything to that? I guess I can categorically ensure the uh, person who asked the question that it is being worked on um, every day. So... The, there's no question that uh, progress is being made daily, and you know it, it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The resources are being being put out, and you can yeah. follow the project on GitHub, and you can make sure that everything is. But commits are being made consistently, yeah. and papers are being written. So it's a process. So that completes our Reddit questions. So I want to thank all our Reddit users. I had a couple like and ending questions for you and um you know i i wanted to phrase this question correctly in a way that doesn't make you feel uncomfortable but you know here on the podcast we have a lot of people a lot of enthusiasts who are coming from various different backgrounds whether they're coming from an investing background or they're coming from an academic background but there are a lot of people that are financially involved with this project and can you give us a landscape? And it doesn't have to be personal, but maybe it can be um, more of a community thing be behind the behind the scenes of IOHK. How enthusiastic are the employees who work at IOHK about Cardano? And you know, you, I mean, you don't have to put out names or anything like that. But what what is the sentiment that goes behind? What what is the sentiment behind the scenes? Yeah, I would say that everyone has a really positive attitude that I work with and they're just as excited about the future of Cardano and the work they're putting into it 
as um, as the community is. You know, it almost feels to me like the people working at IOHK are not somehow separate from the community. That they're they're also uh, fans of the project, and in a, in a way, like we're depending on each other, just like the community depends on IOHK to release um, products. So, you know, no, no single person is uh, in control of, of everything. So like I work on data lists, but I am depending on the, um, the Cardano team to do their work and, you know, stick, stick to the plan as much as they depend on me to work on the wallet and implement the features that are, you know, planned out. So, um, I really see like the, the IOHK employees as part of the community in more ways than they, than they are separate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a good answer. And yeah. maybe, maybe, um, um, a spin-off question to that answer. How important are the investors to this project, in your opinion? How, in, how important are the enthusiasts? You're in Telegram, you see the passion of people. How important are the members who are not necessarily writing code for the project, but campaigning for the project? Yeah, I think it's uh, really important for the community to ad adopt Cardano once there is a way to put it in the hands of developers. Um, because the way you get uh, large scale investments is through usage of the network. Um, now you could have individuals that are, are just wanting to invest huge amounts of money into ADA and they never intend to develop any products or use it in a business context. And, you know, in that sense, the community and reputation of the project is still important because like a large investor is gonna, they're gonna look to see like, what are people saying about it? And, you know, it'll probably be anecdotal stories and then I'm sure further research depending on the amount of money, right? But, you know, the overall reputation is important on every level. And so I think in terms of the community adopting it, um, the actual developers who will be building on Cardano, uh, it's important to to make their lives as easy as possible when they do want to use the tools. Um, because adoption is, at the end of the day, a matter of developers building using Cardano. So if, if it's a pain in the ass to use and it's uh, you know, a bad developer experience, then they probably won't want to build on it. And if they are helping um, someone high up in a, in a company decide whether to build on Cardano or another, another blockchain, then their opinion is going to be really important. Um, you know, the people with the technical uh, know-how are the ones who are going to be influencing their their superiors to build on cardano or not to and then also individual developers they'll they'll make that same choice if they're building their own apps so um it it's super important that people support the project in any way they can in that sense thanks for that perspective that's yeah. very good i wanted to ask you um you know are there any the, you're very familiar. You're very involved in the blockchain space. You're very involved with Cardano. Are there any features from any other projects that you maybe want implemented within Daedalus or implemented within Cardano? And that could be like privacy features or certain features that you think that we can benefit from as a community. I know that we are open source, and the goal is to take whatever is great from other communities and add it to our project as well, because other projects are doing some great things as well. Are there any certain features or protocols that you would like to see added to Cardano? Yeah, so there is one kind of general uh, architectural feature that I've seen, um, for instance, in 
the Stellar Network, they have an API that's it's kind of like the central point of contact with their ecosystem. It, it's called uh, Horizon. And this is where developers would get information about the network or interact with the blockchain. And it's, it's like a centralized API that allows you to do anything you can imagine with the network, right? Um, and with Cardano, there's a, a, a similar um, development process going on to create a GraphQL um, API that kind of connects all the different facets of the Cardano ecosystem into a location where it's consumable by developers. Um, so I think that that feature is really important. And, you know, you may be having uh, the guys working on that onto the show in the future, like Reese and Sam. Okay. Um, so that, you know, I won't go into any details about it because I'm sure they could do a better job than, than I can because they're working on it. But that, um, that API layer where the developers get familiar with the ecosystem and use it is super important and yeah, a feature that I'm looking forward to. Awesome. That's great to hear. Thank you, Marcus. We had Marcus Herney, the front end developer for Daedalus. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time. Um, do you have any last words for the community? We'd love to have you back on in the future. And um, this was a pleasure. Marcus, the floor is yours. If not, I'll wrap this up. Um, I think I think we covered it all. Thanks for having me. Okay, that's awesome. So thanks everyone. Episode 27 is complete and expect some new podcast episodes in the coming weeks. We have a docket and we're going to try to pump out as even more content in the coming months. So thank you again for listening and watching. Drop a comment below. And once again, the best thing you can do if you're watching this and you're not subscribed to the Cardano Effect, please just hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Put, them, put some comments below. Like, share, comment. We, we're really trying to push this podcast up. We want to be the premier Cardano podcast. We want to be the premier blockchain cloud, um, podcast. And we're going to continue to grow. So thank you once again for your time. And have a great day or a great evening wherever you're located. Bye, everyone.